Hello, and welcome into the Star Wars Legends Lounge, the show that celebrates the books from Star Wars Legends. I'm Aaron Motes. On today's episode, it's another first-time read for me in the Clone Wars era. It's Jedi Trial by David Sherman and Dan Cragg. It's the story of Padawan Anakin Skywalker and Jedi Knight Nija Halcyon leading Republic forces to liberate the planet Praesitlin from Separatist forces. More on that in a few minutes. But first, it's listener question time. Today's question comes from my brother, Shane, who says, Why doesn't Anakin see his own parallel with Galen Erso? It's essentially the same playbook. Find somebody who's exceptional, target their family, keep the knowledge of their offspring secret. Erso was a famous scientist, so Anakin slash Vader obviously knows who he is. Shouldn't Anakin have known he was being duped too? Now, before I answer my brother's question, I guess I should give you listeners a little background. Shane isn't really deep into the weeds with Star Wars like I am. He's much more of a mainstream fan. He's seen the movies and some of the live action shows on Disney+, Plus, but he's never watched any of the animated shows or read any of the novels or comics in either Legends or Canon. But unlike me, Shane has played a couple of the video games. He's got Jedi Fallen Order and Battlefront 2, so he knows those stories more than I do. But my brother does listen to this podcast, probably just to support his older brother. And I thank him very much for that. Now, on to Shane's email. First is the real-world answer. Anakin didn't see a parallel with how Galen Erso was being manipulated, because Galen Erso's story wasn't even conceived until years after the original and prequel trilogies. Anakin couldn't have seen a parallel with a character that didn't exist when Vader's story had already been told. But, just for fun, let's imagine the Star Wars saga was told chronologically. Could Anakin have seen a parallel with how Galen Erso was being manipulated? Sure. But, let's face it. Anakin realized that the Emperor had duped him pretty early on, probably right after he woke up in Vader's suit. There are dozens of examples in the books and comics that take place in the first few years after Anakin's fall to the dark side, where he thinks about the lies that Palpatine has told him, lamenting how he allowed the Emperor to twist his anger with the Jedi and attacking Padme. Now, that's not to say that Vader regretted turning to the dark side. He still wanted to become the most powerful Force user and bring order to the galaxy. But Vader did understand that Darth Sidious was manipulating him. It's the way of the Sith, after all. Now, when it comes to Galen Erso, if Vader knew about him, I honestly don't think he'd really care how the Empire was able to get him to work on the Death Star project whether through appeals, coercion, or outright threats. All that mattered was to get Galen Erso working on the Kyber Crystal Death Star laser. Is Galen's story similar to Anakin's from a certain point of view? Sure. Would Vader have cared? I don't think so. Now, there is one part of my brother's question I don't agree with, and that's the secret offspring. Everyone in the Empire, except Galen Erso and Saul Guerrera, thought Jin was dead. So, unless there was an Imperial spy high up in the Rebellion, which there very well could have been, but we don't know for sure at this point, the only Imperial who learned that Jin was Galen's daughter was Director Krennic, and that was just before Krennic died on Scarif. Presumably... Vader never learned the identity of the rebels that stole the Death Star plans, at least as far as we know right now. So I don't think that when Vader learned Luke's identity and then Leia's later on, I don't think he would have seen a parallel in that specific aspect with Galen Erso also having a hidden child. Thanks for the email, Shane. Now, If you want to be really cool, just like my brother, 
and have a question answered on the show, you can email me at swlegendslounge at gmail.com or you can send me a tweet at legendslounge1. Or if you'd like to get your voice on the show, just record yourself and email it in. Just please record your file in MP3 or MP4 audio format. Now it's time to dive into today's book, Jedi Trial, a Clone Wars novel by David Sherman and Dan Cragg. Grab yourself a drink and let's head in to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. The story begins in the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Obi-Wan Kenobi is searching for his Padawan, Anakin Skywalker. When the two meet, Obi-Wan tells Anakin that he's being sent on a mission, but Anakin won't be going along. The news frustrates Anakin, but Obi-Wan tries to reassure his apprentice, telling him to take the time that Obi-Wan is away to study in the Jedi archives, because... When Obi-Wan returns, he promises to put Anakin before the Jedi Council. It's time for Anakin to face his trials and become elevated to Jedi Knight. Elsewhere, Count Dooku orders an attack on the planet Presitlin, the home of the Republic's Intergalactic Communications Center. Presitlin is in the Sluis Sector, and Dooku knows the Republic will be cautious in sending troops given the defense required at the Sluis Van shipyards. Admiral Pors Taneth, immune and member of the banking clan, will lead the assault, laying siege to the space lanes surrounding Presitlin and landing more than one million battle droids on the planet's surface. The ground fighting is fierce, but it's a rout. The droids all but wipe out the planetary defense force and capture the communications center. Tanith takes the communications techs hostage and issues an ultimatum to the Republic. Give Presitlin to the Separatists, or the hostages will be executed. At the Jedi Temple, Anakin begrudgingly continues to study battle tactics. One day, he meets Nija Helcyon, a Jedi Knight that the Council has put on ice for a while, after he lost his ship to pirates during his last command. The two form a quick friendship, dining together and sparring daily with their lightsabers. Halcyon is impressed with Anakin's skills, but when the Padawan voices his frustration with having to stay at the temple during his master's latest mission, Halcyon preaches patience. Your master is a man of his word, Halcyon tells Anakin. When Obi-Wan returns, Halcyon says, he will put Anakin forth for knighthood. He tells Anakin to keep up his studies until then. The Jedi will need Anakin as the war continues. While Coruscant debates how to answer Tanis' demands, a mercenary force led by General Zazrider Slake arrives in system and launches a counterattack. Slake's army strikes quickly, surprising Tanith and taking a fort a few kilometers away from the communications center. They also find two PDF survivors hiding in the desert hills near the fort, Odi Subu, a scout recon trooper, and Lieutenant Irk Harmon, a fighter pilot. Admiral Tanith orders an assault on Slake's defensive line. The droid army rolls over most of Slake's flanks, but the mercenaries hold on to the center. During the battle, Odi and Irk are trapped when their bunker caves in, burying them under tons of rock. On Coruscant, Chancellor Palpatine finally orders Republic forces to attack Presitlin and retake the Intergalactic Communications Center. The Jedi select Nija Helcyon to lead the attack, and he decides to take Anakin as his second in command. Their forces consist of 20,000 clone troopers, a clone commando squad, an ARC trooper, and a small fleet of Republic cruisers and picket ships. En route to Presitlin, Anakin and Halcyon both reveal they've broken the Jedi Code. Anakin tells Halcyon about his secret marriage to Padme, and Nija tells Anakin about his family on Corellia, 
a wife and son. He admits to having some of the same frustrations with the stodgy rules from the Jedi Council. Halcyon says he looks forward to the end of the war, when he can see his family again. He tells Anakin he hopes for a day when they don't have to keep that part of their lives a secret from anyone. At Praesitlin, Tanith orders another attack on Slake's forces. As the droid army advances on Slake's command center, the mercenaries organize one final stand. But, just as the attack begins, Republic troops arrive in system. Halcyon orders Anakin to lead the clone dropships to fortify Slake's remaining forces, while he leads the fleet to attack and clear the planetary siege. Anakin and the clones land just in time to repel the droids from Slake's fortification and drive them back to the Mesa, which houses the Intergalactic Communications Center. After clearing the Separatist fleet in orbit, Halcyon arrives to take command of the ground forces. When night falls, Halcyon sends out three reconnaissance squads to find the weak spot in Tanith's lines. The squad probing the right flank finds a weakness near a pair of rocky cliffs. As the squad returns with the information, they pass a destroyed bunker and find Urk and Obi, still alive and trying to free themselves from the rocks. The recon squad takes the former Planetary Defense Force members back to Halcyon's command center. The Jedi formulate a plan to attack the Mesa. Anakin will lead a clone strike force through the weak spot on the right flank of the droid line while Halcyon and Strake bomb the center, hoping to fool Admiral Tanith into thinking that is where the Republic forces plan to attack. But Tanith is smart. He predicts Halcyon's plan, reinforcing the right flank just before dawn. When Anakin Strike Force lands, the droids wait until they advance between the cliffs. Then, they spring an ambush, trapping Anakin's squad in the rocks. It's a massacre. Anakin loses almost all of his clone forces, and Anakin himself is lucky to escape with his life. Back in orbit, one of the Republic picket ships spots a large ship emerge from hyperspace in the outskirts of the system. Separatist reinforcements have arrived. They determine it'll take about a day for the battleship to make orbit around Praesitlin. When the information is relayed to Halcyon, he, Anakin, and Slake realize they only have a handful of hours to take back the communications center. Once the Separatist reinforcements arrive, they'll either have to flee the planet or be wiped out. Halcyon calls a war council to see if anyone can come up with a plan to recapture the communications center and save the remaining hostages before the Separatist battleship reaches orbit. The outlook is grim. Several ideas are thrown around, but none of them are ideal. Finally, Anakin suggests a plan. Halcyon and Strake will lead their remaining forces on a direct assault on the Mesa, while he leads two ships of clone commandos to strike from the rear. Anakin's objective is to blast into the communications center, free as many hostages as possible, and escape. Once his squad is away, Halcyon will order an orbital bombardment. The communications center is lost, Anakin argues, It'll be impossible for the small number of Republic troops remaining to hold it with Separatist reinforcements on the way. Reluctantly, Halcyon agrees to the plan. The two strike ships will need to fly low around the Mesa, skimming the surface of the planet to keep below Separatist surveillance. Anakin will pilot the first ship, and Urk volunteers to fly the second. Anakin also decides to take Obi, the only person who's ever been inside the communications center. When the attack begins, Anakin's strike team blasts into the back door of the comm center. They run into a squad of battle droids, stopping the attack. Then, Anakin steps forward and ignites his lightsaber. His moves are a blur. He advances quickly and slices through the droids. Obi watches on, amazed. She's never seen anything like this before. Finally, the strike team enters the communications center's command room. They begin to free the hostages when Tanith enters with another squad of battle droids. He orders the droids to fire on Anakin, but 
one of the hostages jumps in front of him, taking a blaster bolt to the chest. Stunned at the woman's sacrifice, Anakin's anger rises within him. He draws on the force and rushes Tanith and the droids. No longer worried about freeing the hostages, Anakin's focus narrows on executing Tanith. He slices through the droids with ease and advances on the Separatist Admiral. But just before Anakin beheads Tanith, he hears the voice of Qui-Gon Jinn. It tells him to remain calm, to find peace, and to turn away from the dark. Slowly, Anakin calms himself and takes Tanith into custody. The Battle of Praesitlin ends with Anakin and Halcyon leading a squadron of starfighters against the Separatist cruiser. Anakin destroys the ship, ending the occupation of the system. Time for a break. When we come back, I'll talk more about Jedi Trial. I'm Aaron Motes. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. Thanks for listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge, where we celebrate the books from Star Wars Legends. But allow me to suggest a book from Star Wars canon. Queen's Peril is the story of young Padme Amidala in the first few weeks after she's elected Queen of Naboo. Joined by a group of young women with extraordinary skills, Padme and her handmaidens learn how to govern while the threat of the Trade Federation looms over the planet. That's Queen's Peril, by E.K. Johnston. Welcome back to the Star Wars Legends Lounge, the show that celebrates the books from Star Wars Legends. I'm Aaron Motes, and today's book is Jedi Trial by David Sherman and Dan Cragg. I always like when Star Wars novels mix it up a little bit, and this story was definitely a war story. For those of you that have read the canon books, Twilight Squadron and Inferno Squad, we're talking almost that level of in the dirt, in the muck, in the mire, war story. There are several chapters in this book that are gritty, that are grimy. If you have a bit of a weak stomach, some of the Injuries that the soldiers and the clones suffer are pretty graphic. They're pretty grim. I didn't want to put that in my synopsis of the book in the first half of the show because this is a show for people of all ages. And some of that stuff, like I said, was pretty graphic. It may not be appropriate for some younger Star Wars enthusiasts, but it's the kind of story that I like. I really like Anakin's characterization at this point in the timeline, directly after the events of Attack of the Clones. You get a lot of the inner turmoil, like what you see with Anakin and Padme at the Lars homestead during Attack of the Clones. Not to that extreme. There's nothing really that happens in this book that makes Anakin that angry outside of at the very end when one of the hostages sacrifices herself to save Anakin from being shot. But you do have Anakin struggling with wanting to become more powerful, wanting to become recognized by the Jedi Council for how he has advanced so quickly as a Padawan. He wants to be knighted. He wants to be knighted now. A lot of the book is told from Anakin's point of view. And a lot of times I'm not the biggest fan of having one main point of view. I like when a story jumps around. But I think this book does just enough of that to where we're not inside Anakin's head throughout the whole story. But like I said, the biggest appeal to me to this book were the battle scenes, the war scenes, the grittiness, the griminess. Credit 
to the two authors, David Sherman and Dan Craig. Now, if you own this book and you look up the author notes at the very back of the book, you see that they're two pretty accomplished military science fiction authors. Both of them served in the military. David Sherman was a former U.S. Marine who served during Vietnam. Dan Craig was a member of the U.S. Army and used to work for the Defense Department. The copy that I have doesn't list whether or not he ever served during wartime or saw action, but you can definitely tell that the authors of this book had military experience with the way they described military bureaucracy, chain of command. Some of the battle scenes make you feel like you're right there in the trenches with the planetary defense force or with the clones. This is definitely not the type of story I would want most of the time in Star Wars. I think most people understand what story you're getting with a Star Wars story. Good space wizards battling evil space wizards over this mystical energy field called the Force. But stories tend to get stale for me when they're told the same way over and over again. And I like when it's mixed up some. I like having the war story. One of the appeals for the Rogue Squadron books for me is that it's Top Gun in space. It's not the gritty, grimy battle scenes like you read here in Jedi Trial, but it's not your typical Star Wars story. At least it's not written the same way. Nija Halcyon was an interesting character, although you don't get a whole lot, in my opinion, about Nija in this book. You do, however, get that this is a Corellian Jedi who had a secret wife, and a son. For those of you who have listened to the show from the beginning and you've put the pieces together, that son, Valen Halcyon, changes his name to Hal Horn and is the father of Corrin Horn of Rogue Squadron fame. So Nija Halcyon is Corrin Horn's grandfather. I don't know the wife's name, but the son, Valen Halcyon. Valen is now canon. For those of you that watch the Obi-Wan Kenobi show, and remember when Obi-Wan and little Princess Leia were hiding out with the hidden underground, and all of the arabesh that was carved into that wooden wall that Obi-Wan was reading... One of the names, of course, was Quinlan Voss. Another one of the names that is carved into that wood is Valen Halcyon. It'll be interesting to see if anything is ever done with that, or if it's just a neat little Easter egg for those of us who have read Legends. I could see either or. It's there if they want to use it. But coming back to this book, Nija Halcyon is a decent enough character. Like I said, there's not a whole lot with him, in my opinion, outside of the fact that he's a bit of a parallel for Anakin. He's more somber, though, than Anakin is. It could be because he's older. It could also be because he's failed. He lost his ship to pirates while out on a mission for the Jedi Council. He's not the greatest Jedi in the galaxy. But while he's somber, he's not sad. He's upbeat, generally. He's optimistic. He wants to see Anakin succeed. He wants to see Anakin become a Jedi Knight. And at the beginning of the book, especially when they are still on Coruscant, Nija helps him along. He helps him with his studies. He helps him with lightsaber sparring. The two have numerous conversations. And 
they become friends. I do know that Nijai Halcyon is in a number of comic books that take place during this era. I haven't read any of them. So it'll be interesting to see if he's in any more of the Clone Wars era novels that I'll be reading for this show. I only have two real criticisms of this book. The first is the characters of Obi and Urk. They are the only two survivors that we know of, of the Planetary Defense Force. The story seems to take place over about a two-week, maybe a three-week span. They meet each other after the initial invasion by the Separatist forces. At first, they're marooned out in the desert, but eventually they're saved by Slake's forces. Then they're stuck in a bunker for several days after that bunker is shelled by separatist mortars. Part of the bunker caves in, trapping them, and it takes them a handful of days to cut themselves out. So it's not like they didn't spend a lot of time together, but this time is under extreme stress. Emotions run high in wartime. I'm not saying any of this is out of the ordinary. It could absolutely happen. But they develop a romantic relationship over these two to three weeks that the book takes place. And at the end, they get married. In fact, they have Anakin officiate the ceremony. I just wasn't a big fan of that small part of the story. And yes, it is a very small part of the story. So it's something that's easy to look past. The second little thing I didn't like, and the only thing that actually bugged me a little bit, was a joke that was made about two-thirds of the way through the story. I think I've said it before, but I have a pretty narrow sense of humor. I don't find as many things funny as most people do. It's not to say I don't have a sense of humor. The stuff that I find hilarious, I laugh at all the time. But I admit it's a narrower sense of humor than most people. One type of joke that is not for me, that actually I find really annoying, and sometimes it makes me angry, are jokes that last way too long. And I understand the structure of the joke. That is part of it. The fact that it lasts a long time is part of the joke. There's a part about two-thirds of the way through where Obi is talking to Slake's protocol droid. And the droid just starts listing off the things that it's qualified to do and the jobs that it has had in its past. And it lasts two full pages. When I got to that part, I actually closed the book. I did. I said that was enough reading for me today. I closed the book. I said I'll start back in tomorrow. Usually I don't stop unless I reach the end of a chapter. But it was just one of those things that I said, okay, I understand this is a joke. This joke is not for me. I don't want to continue reading while I'm annoyed because it's going to color my opinion for the next handful of pages of the book. So I just closed it there. But I understand many people will find it funny. Anyway, we're getting close to the end of the show, but first, two more people have emailed in their personal Starfighter Squadrons. We didn't have any for the last episode. It's great that we had two people email in for this one. First up, it's listener Jacob, who says he decided to make his squadron more of a hybrid special forces squadron, sort of like Wraith Squadron, with characters who can hold their own both in a cockpit and on the ground and he gave the leader a command support ship. 
So, allow me to introduce Echo Squadron, named after Jacob's favorite ARC trooper and member of Clone Force 99. Here we go. One flight. Echo leader, Hera Syndulla, piloting the Ghost, which includes the full Ghost crew, along with Rebels Era, Ahsoka Tano, and Captain Rex. Echo 2 is Garrick the Face Loran from Race Squadron. Echo 3, Aiden Versio from Battlefront 2, Inferno Squad. And Echo 4, Poe Dameron, who, Jacob says, may be a better pilot than soldier, but he thinks he can hold his own on the ground as well. Two flight is Skywalker flight. Echo 5, Luke Skywalker. Echo 6, Jaina Solo. Echo 7, Ben Solo. And Echo 8, Ray Skywalker. Three flight is the Jedi flight. All flying Jedi starfighters. Echo 9, Plo Koon. Echo 10, Sacy Tien. Echo 11 is Anakin Skywalker. And Echo 12, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who, Jacob says, famously doesn't enjoy flying, but he's still a worthy pilot and will make a great wingman for Anakin. Bonus ship for Jacob's Echo Squad is the Millennium Falcon, piloted by Han Solo, co-piloted by Chewie, Finn and Nian Nub on the guns, with Lando Calrissian, Leia Organa, and C-3PO all aboard for support. Jacob says he couldn't have the Falcon be in a squadron and not be the lead ship, so instead, it's in a support role for whatever the mission needs. That's Echo Squadron. Great choices, Jacob. The second email comes from Jim, who put an interesting spin on our squadron list. Jim says he wanted to create a ragtag team of heroes or villains following the format of A New Hope, almost like a fantasy football league. So, you need to have one Force user, one non-Force user, a pilot, a droid, a wildcard character, and a ship, much like those that flew in the Millennium Falcon leaving Tatooine in A New Hope. Jim says he made a team that he thought would be fun to see go on missions, and this is what it consists of. His force user is Quinlan Voss. His pilot, Poe Dameron. His non-force user is Wrecker from the Bad Batch. His wildcard character is Fennec Shand, the bounty hunter. K2SO is his droid, and the ship, the Slave One. Nice list, Jim. Interesting fantasy football team, but I guess it's not really fantasy football. We'll call it fantasy dive ball, just to keep it Star Wars. Time for me to wrap up. If you have a question or comment for the show, you can email me at swlegendslounge at gmail.com or send me a tweet at legendslounge1. Or if you want to get your voice on the show, just record your own audio file and email it in. Just remember, record it in MP3 or MP4 audio format. And keep sending me in your Star Wars favorite character Starfighter Squadrons. It's one of my favorite parts of the show. Coming up on the next episode, I'm jumping ahead into the Rebellion era with The Force Unleashed by Sean Williams. That episode will drop on September 30th. Once again, thank you so much for listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. I'm Aaron Motes. May the Force be with you. And remember, there's always a bit of truth in Legends.